A very good morning to you. My name is Haram Peturius and I'm a head of strategic communications for the IRR. Welcome to today's online webinar where you are joining us for the launch of the second paper in our series of Blueprint for Growth papers, the IRR's Blueprint for Growth. These papers are aimed at establishing a framework to get South Africa to a place of pro-growth policies, as these policies, we believe, unlock the amazing potential of South Africans. Today's paper will be, oh, today's presentation, pardon me, will be a look at some of the highlights from the paper being launched, slash waste cut taxes. Over the last few months, my colleague Gabriel Krauser has been looking into South Africa's public finances and our fiscal potential. And today is the result of that in-depth research. Joining us for today is the IRR CEO, John Endres. Just a brief note on how we will proceed. Gabriel will lead us through his presentation, and then there will be a Q&A session, which I will chair, and Gabriel and John will be able to answer questions. Thank you very, very much. We hope you enjoy today's presentation. Gabriel, over to you. Thank you, Arman, uh, and greetings all. Uh, growth indeed uh, is key. Um, and here we have a uh, you know, pretty straightforward idea, an idea that um, I think probably deserves a, a second thought. Uh, the agenda is as follows. Uh, first, we're gonna look at the really big problem. What is it? Uh, a candidate cause uh, is is it the case that uh, white monopoly capital, uh, some form of apartheid legacy discrimination, um, is behind this big problem? Uh, that's one candidate we often see discussed in Parliament, for example. Uh, then we move to a second cause, candidate hypothetical cause. Uh, is, it, is corruption really what's uh, bringing South Africa down? We're going to look at regulation. We're going to look at the Fukuyama framework. Um, that'll be probably pretty fresh for most people. Um, then we're going to look at quantity versus quality of government, which falls out of this Fukuyama framework. Uh, tied down score, um, tax increase effectiveness, decrease the fiscal multiplier analysis from Saab. We'll just review that very quickly and uh, then talk about the Zondo dividends. And that'll all lead us where I think most South Africans desperately want to go, which is towards a solution-oriented way of thinking about things um, to deliver growth, to deliver solutions to the biggest problems. So how big is the problem? You know, I think sometimes it can feel a little bit like you get stuck in a rut of conversations about politics uh, that, are, that are kind of gloomy. Uh, I'm in Cape Town now. And uh, I go to a coffee shop, I walk down the street, and uh, pretty much every week I bump into someone that uh, I've known in my Johannesburg life and that I haven't seen in a long time. And the conversation is, you know, hello, how's it? So nice to see you. And then we catch up a little bit and then turn to politics, like, what are you doing here? It tends to be a pretty gloomy view of how things are going in the country, maybe a jolly view about how things are going in certain parts of it. Um, but overall, a gloomy view. And then you think to yourself, is this just like an echo chamber? Is it just I'm talking to certain kinds of people and I'm getting certain kinds of responses as a result of that? Because we all, after all, um, are constrained to the limits of our lived experience. Uh, and I think to, to pierce through that, it's nice to use survey literature, something that Institute of Race Relations does a lot. Um, to me, the most profound uh, survey really on South Africa is the Ipsos uh, wrong direction, right direction, popular opinion poll, which is done across, let's say 40, 50 odd countries around the world. Um, and many of them developing countries and many of them advanced countries. And uh, they ask the question, do you think your country is going in the right direction or is it on the wrong track? And South Africa, since Ramaphosa, since President Ramaphosa became the president, has had the worst average negative answer to that question of anywhere in the world. This includes Argentina comes second worst. Um, you know, they've had 
uh, their currency, the peso, was was similar to ours in its power to the dollar. So let's say 15 to one, then it went up to 60 to one. Uh, you know, hyperinflation, uh, real real desperation and frustration. Um, and they're not as gloomy as we are, uh, on average, over the last five years. And it's not just that South Africans are gloomy. You can see if you look at the slide, back in November 2017, pretty gloomy. By February 2018, after, you know, in Ramaphoria, actually most South Africans are positive uh, about the direction the country's going in. Uh, we beat the world average uh, for the only time in the last five years in, at the peak of Ramaphoria. And then you see it decline again. See a little spike again during COVID, during that hard lockdown, come together, strong family, you know, vibes, um, and, and and then it declines again as we see how failed that policy was. And so many other failed policies have been. Uh, so we have the worst uh, recorded uh, prospect. You know, most people have have a more pessimistic attitude here than anywhere else. And that's a, that's really a big problem because. If people feel dejected, um, it's, 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 it's a recipe for, for mistrust, it's a recipe for populism, it's a recipe for, for non-solutions-oriented thinking. So we have to pierce through that pessimism with a way forward that's actually going to work. What is causing this pessimism? What's causing this, this, this bad outlook, this, this, this sense that we're in the wrong track? Um, Institute of Regulation surveys done since 2013 was asked, what do you think the biggest problem is? Uh, different methodologies and... The, the, the dominant answer is always unemployment. Uh, we don't usually ask uh, this question in terms of race, don't ever. Uh, my suspicion is that black unemployment in particular is the biggest cause of distress in South Africa. And uh, this graph, you, you've got the official unemployment rate, you've got the official number of unemployed people and uh, uh, roughly doubling from uh, 2000 and S. You see it starts a little bit flat, it goes up, it comes down in the mid-2000s. Uh, and then from 2008, it goes from uh, just under 4 million to, to approaching uh, 7.5 million. And uh, the expanded definition, which includes discouraged work seekers, uh, doubles uh, as well. You see that comes down dramatically in the mid-2000s. It, it, it spiked up at around 7 million, came down to about 5, and now it's at... Uh, Actually, came out to 4.8 and now it's at 10.7 million unemployed at the, at the last stats they say. I think that's the big problem. And then the big question is okay, you know, what's, the, what, what's causing black unemployment? And, and, you know, one answer is apartheid legacy, white monopoly capital, implicit bias, uh, this kind of thing. Um, and I think these two pie charts sort of help answer. That hypothetical without getting into you know uh, a moralistic view there certainly is a, a moral answer to this question um should uh, whites be blamed for for all that's wrong in south africa but i think that uh, often the debate kind of falls apart when you get to the point where uh, one political group is saying you know uh, this race is to blame and another political group is saying no this race is kind of innocent um I think that I think that uh, there, there, there can be a breakdown in communication there that can be transcended by just looking at the numbers. Is it possible that whites have such buying power that they could distort the market in such a way that could explain, uh, in the period from 2008 to the present, the doubling in black unemployment? Uh, that's the question, and we look at these pie charts to see the answer. We see. Uh, on the one side, income by race in 2006. What was the biggest single slice? This is stats SA data, derived from stats SA data. The biggest single slice of quarter was the white middle 50%. Uh, and if you combine, and then you see the second biggest slice is the black top 10%. Uh, and the third biggest slice is the black middle 50%. And the next slice is the, the white uh, top 10%. And you have to go really far down the chart to get to the black bottom, 14%. Uh, huge, that's the largest group of, second largest group of people by number, but uh, it has one of the smallest uh, shares of income. Um, and I think that fits a lot of people's pictures of sort of like apartheid era South Africa. I mean, a little bit more 
post-apartheid with the black top 10% coming in second and the black middle 50% coming in third. Um, but things really changed by 2015, according to status. Now the black top 10% is in pole position uh, and the black middle 50% is in second place. Uh, so obviously this is not per capita. This doesn't mean uh, you know, within the top 10% that there's demographic representativity, um, but it means that the, if you're sort of dissecting uh, societies by race and class and thinking you know, which group uh, is uh, in a position to dominate, um, it's, it's, it's just obviously not the white group um, by 2015. Uh, the, the potential for exerting distorting oligopsony effect, they're called, uh, which is when you use your buying power in this kind of distorting way, uh, are radically diminished. In fact, by 2015, whites only earn roughly a third of national income. So again, more than national demographic representativity, but at only a third, not enough to uh, have the kind of buying power that would explain why black unemployment is going up. Uh, so it's just a database way of kind of putting to the side uh, that kind of uh, hypothesis. Um, you know, if you want to climb further up the ladder uh, in terms of... Uh, uh, where government money is directed, I think it's interesting to note that uh, specified procurement by BEE level uh, in 2017, um, which is the latest data available until just last night, actually, um, had 40% of uh, the procurement budgets going to uh, level one, BEE level one companies. And those are companies that are uh, predominantly black owned, managed, operated. Um, so, uh, I think uh, if you consider that the procurement spend is 1.1 trillion rand, uh, and you consider that of specified contracts, uh, uh, the level one companies are, are, are getting the lion's share, and then you know level two, level three, they're also very similar. Level four, um, the notion that uh, uh, that black businesses are, are not making lots of money. Um, is 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 readily dispelled. Uh, the idea again being you know, white monopoly capital is stopping black businesses from making money, and that's causing black people to be unemployed. That notion is just readily dispelled. Uh, if you think every year, sort of a trillion rand is being spent, and um, this you know this was just a sample of uh, the, this pie chart is based on a sample of about two hundred billion. Uh, but the Treasury said it was a, a representative sample of sort of how the money generally gets spent. So it's like you know, hundreds and hundreds of Billions of rands every year are being spent on predominantly black businesses, uh, delivering services. Um, so I think that puts away that hypothesis, the white monopoly capital hypothesis. Here's another hypothesis. Why is black unemployment doubled um, in the BEE era? And uh, it's that uh, corruption has increased. And you know, this is an interesting hypothesis. This, it's true that there's corruption everywhere, uh, but in South Africa, there is something really special going on. Um, this data comes from the World Bank. Uh, they rank uh, 180 to 200 countries uh, on perceived corruption control. That's the ability of the government to control corruption. Let's remember, whenever there's uh, corruption, uh, uh, typically this kind of corruption involves public entities and private entities. Uh, both sides are corrupt. It takes two to tango. But of course, sometimes you can just have private to private corruption, like price fixing, uh, five companies getting together and setting up a price cartel. It's happened with bread price fixing uh, 15 years ago and so on. Um, that's also a form of corruption that government is uh, duty bound to control. So a failure of corruption control is, you know, it's always uh, in a sense the government's fault because the background assumption in government is that you know, most societies, most people are going to be good, but there are going to be some crooks and this government's duty to stop the crooks. So how good is the government stopping the crooks? Well, it, it, it was up there, it slid down, it improved in the mid-2000s. Um, it's a story we see again and again in the mid-2000s, there was improvement. And then it slides right back down. Uh, and these are percentile rankings. So it means uh, in the 90s, South Africa was in the top quarter in the country in the world. It, sorry, it was the top quarter amongst the top um, quarter of countries in the world. So let's say the top 50 countries in the world um, at combating corruption. And it's now in the bottom 50%. Uh, 
so that means there's a long way to go if we keep down on this trend. You know, there's still half the countries in the world that are worse off. Um, but we're heading there. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna learn what it feels like to be in an even worse position if we don't uh, change this trend. Um, the single worst year in decline is the last year, 2021 to 2022. I think that says something about um, state capital 2.0. Uh, it, it's you know you're in the middle of it, um, and. Uh, I think it's finally important to note that on the World Bank ranking, South Africa has the the, the worst decline in corruption of any you know, constitutional sovereign democracy um, that the World Bank has recorded. So depending on how you count it, <laughs> there are a couple of countries that are worse in terms of how fast they've declined. Um, Zimbabwe, the West Bank in Gaza, um, uh, Eritrea. Uh, but yeah. Of, of anything you'd want to compare yourself to, it's the worst in the world in terms of the decline, uh, the, the, the speed of decline over the last couple of decades. Uh, so that does put corruption in a special case. And then you think to yourself, well, you know, President Ramaphosa had a Sono address and said, yeah, corruption, we get it. We we know that it's been a terrible thing, said Caps has been a terrible thing. Um, it's, it was a few individuals who took charge of the state and then did terrible deals with corruptors. Uh, is it a few individuals? I think when it's that bad, the few, the few bad apples hypothesis kind of falls away. So we turn to, you know, what systemic causes for corruption could there be? And we see again, World Bank data, regulatory quality. This is the quality of, of laws and regulations. How good are they at systemically setting it up so that uh, government is more likely to be affected or so that it's less likely to be affected? Uh, because, you know, you can have really good people, but if you've got bad rules, if you've got a bad system, can get bad outcomes. You can have pretty average people. If you've got good rules, you get good outcomes. And we see here a, a, a radical decline. Again, it's, it's top 10 worst rates of decline in the world. And we've gone from the top quarter to the bottom half. And a long way to go uh, if we keep going this way. So this brings me to uh, the first kind of uh, effort at transcending an ideological uh, gridlock. Because I think you know people are quite familiar with what I've said so far, and and it seems natural to ask yourself, I mean, what are we supposed to do here? Surely we should just um, just just improve just improve uh, the quality of government. Never mind the size of government. Never mind whether we should cut taxes or grow taxes. We should just have better government for what we're already spending. Um, and on the other hand, we in budget week, you know, when you're in budget week, the the treasury doesn't have the ability to improve the quality of government. They have the ability to allocate assets. You know, they decide more here, less there, cut taxes or expand taxes, um, and and often that debate wants to be had in this context of work, never mind how bad government is. Let's just, let's just think about how big or small should taxes be. And often that debate ends up coming down to the debt, which is the one bit of things that government doesn't have direct control of. And that also doesn't directly benefit uh, any South Africans when that debt's repaid. Well, um, not in the kind of way that we usually like to think of, of government benefits worth. Now, the, the, the attempt to transcend ide ideological gridlock uh, comes from Fukuyama, Francis Fukuyama, probably the most prestigious um, sort of socio-political economic analyst uh, to have visited South Africa in the last five years. He gave a talk at BITS in 2019. And uh, he called on South Africans in particular and people around the world to kind of let go of the Cold War gridlock uh, of you know, left-wingers just want more taxes, right-wingers just want less taxes, um, and uh, to sort of have the quality and quantity conversation in harmony uh, rather than as two different conversations. And so this picture kind of depicts what he was uh, talking about. Uh, here on the x-axis, we have government expenses over GDP. So that's you know, how much is the real tax rate? Uh, and it starts at zero. That's like a, some kind of libertarian's dream. Uh, there's no governments at all, an offer. And then it goes to 100%, some kind of communist stream. You know, there's no private sector at all. Everything is taxed. Uh, and in between, uh, you have 
any position that you can want to choose. Um, and you know, so the right wingers traditionally want to move more towards the zero, and the left wingers want to move towards the hundred. Um, and on the y axis, you have government capacity. How good is government at actually fulfilling the roles that it's taken on? And zero is like, you know, can't do anything, can't organize a party in a shabin um, that's already been well stocked. And 100 is, you know, government, just whatever it touches, works out perfect. And the idea here is draw an arbitrary line in terms of its angle. But if you draw a line uh, up uh, from the zero, zero to the 100, 100 points, uh, above that line, you sort of have a government which, in principle, Capacity to efficiently spend the amount of resources that it's getting. So uh, the more efficient it is, the more reasonable it might be for that government to uh, be more expensive. You know, and this and this is a way of thinking about governments, which I think um, I think the idea that Fukuyama is trying to get across is like is like very common sense. It's like government is different to a car or shoes or a computer. Um, but it's not that different, you know. If you if you want uh, to charge more for the computer or the car or the shoes, then it better be better. And if it's if it's like not such a good car or pair of shoes, then it should be cheaper. It shouldn't be taking as much resources up. Um, and so the idea is, if you're in the green zone, you know, then you're kind of getting bang for your buck. And then we can have a debate. You know, if you're in Sweden or Ireland or uh, some country that's like South Korea, it's being, and by the way, you know, Ireland has a pretty small government. South Korea has a pretty large government. But if you're in one of those countries that's being like effectively run, you can have a debate about whether you should increase taxes or decrease them on the basis of left, right, wing ideology. But if you're below the line, if you're being charged, you know, a million bucks for a car that doesn't have an engine, or even four wheels, uh, then you just have to be not spending that much money on the car. You have to be reducing the cost of government because it's it's not effective at the cost that it's at. So that's the sort of idea that's being portrayed there. And I think that if South Africans were to take on this idea, particularly political analysts, because um, I think, I think uh, it's a common sense idea. I think a lot of South Africans are ready to get it. But I think at the analytical past, you have a lot of people that are committed either to the right or to the left on dogmatic terms. And you know, they, they want in any country, wherever it is, they want to grow tax or shrink tax. Um, I don't think those debates, I don't think those conversations really change anyone's minds. And I think they kind of put people off thinking about tax size um, as, as, as an important part of their lives, as something that might be contributing to Unemployment to service delivery, etc., to the ability to get a job, especially though. So I think if, if if it's if it's put in this way, there's a chance of, of transcending that gridlock. Just to uh, look at the compass there, you know, there the compass is not left right. It's 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 these four terms, and the the first term is trim. If you're going up into the left, if you're in the red zone, government's got very expensive and very inefficient. Then one thing you can do is you can have a tax reduction improved manageability schema. So what you do is you want to cut taxes, you want to move to the left, and you want to move up, improve government quality, and reduce taxes. The other thing you might want to do is tax reduction, and uh, you don't worry about decreased efficiency. You know, you'll cut, you'll cut expenses on the police, you'll cut expenses on the prosecuting authority, you'll cut expenses on status, say, watchdogs. You don't mind where you're cutting expenses, even if it makes government overall less effective. You just want to cut expenses. So that's a sort of kind of uh, ideological position. And then you've got this sort of uh, time, team, T I I M, tax increased improved manageability thing, where it's like, well, we've been going in one direction, we've gotten into the red zone where we've increased taxes and, and decreased effectiveness, but now we're going to increase taxes and increase effectiveness. And time, I think, is a, it's a nice thing because Ramaphosa in, in his 2019 election was all about time. Now it's time. This time, we're going to grow the government and we're going to make it more improved. So there's a kind of almost an ideology of hope. Like, we're going to do the same thing, but this time it's going to be better. 
And then there's TIDE, which is tax increase effectiveness decrease. And that is the direction that you really don't want to be going. Obviously, you don't want to be spending more and getting less. Uh, so where's South Africa? Let's look at our expenses. We've been going up. Uh, we've got World Bank data in light blue. We've got the Saab outlays over GDP in dark blue and Saab consolidated expenditure over GDP, um, which includes debt repayments uh, in, in orange there. And you can see that you know, by the consolidated government expenditure over GDP figure, we, we in, in COVID, we pushed hard towards 45%. And uh, it's coming down a little bit, but the rate of decline has slowed. And the overall trend is very much up. And if you look at the quarterly data, uh, some of the chatter after the midterm budget policy statement last year, it looks very much like the uptick is going to, overall uptick trend is going to continue. So, you know, as a proportion of, of the whole economy, government has gone from being, uh, depending on how you count it, less than a less than a quarter to to much over a third, um, and so there's been a huge increase in in the proportion of South African productivity that's absorbed by government. The quarterly expenditure I'm just bringing up to to show you that really it's it's looking pretty grim if you look at the latest in terms of how how how, how much government expenditure is increasing. Grim from the perspective. Of the regulatory and corruption that we saw earlier, not from the perspective that growing governments are intrinsically bad. Some places governments grow and it's great. It's the quality and quantity measured together that's really concerned. You see, on the one axis, the quality of government declining at uh, one of the worst rates in the world, and the quantity of government increasing at one of the fastest rates. Those are again both just the World Bank data points. And you see on the World Bank data points, the quantity of government do that little spike and decrease. But as I say, that, that's 2021 data from then. I think if you look more recently, you're going, to see, you're going to see the uptick return. So that's what it means when you say government is getting more expensive and less effective. And whether you're left wing or right wing, that can't be good. That has to be something that people from either side of, of like ideological divides can just agree that can't be good. That is something that has to be addressed. That is a tax increase, effectiveness decrease picture, tied. You're being tied down when the government's taking more and it's less good quality. There you see uh, another representation of, of South Africa's journey, its tied journey over time. Moving in the, uh, if you remember that compass, moving down and to the right, that's a tied direction. Tax increase, effectiveness decrease, and that's the overall trend. And at some points, you know, you've been seeing uh, there's that little nose around 2002 where it's actually moving in the trim direction, tax reduction, improved manageability. After that came those improved uh, figures, employment, etc. Uh, and after that, you see uh, the quality of government's come down, but the size of it's staying fairly stable. And then uh, both the size is increasing relative to GDP, and the quality is decreasing. Yes, South Africa fitted with the rest of the world. Uh, you can see in 2002, you know, putting the line uh, somewhat arbitrarily um, to divide the red zone from the green zone. In 2002, South Africa is in the green zone. Uh, it's a fairly small government compared to many, and uh, pretty effective. Um, and 96, it was a slightly larger government yeah. and uh, even more effective. So it had decreased in effectiveness relatively, but it also decreased in size. And by 2020, it's, it's plunged down into the right, uh, into this position. And, and you can sort of see, I think part of what's helpful about this picture is you sort of see where other countries lie. You know, So in the, in the top right there, you'll see Finland, Denmark, Estonia, Israel, UK, you know, these are countries with very, very large governments. Um, and, and, but they're, you know, famously quite effective. You know, they've got great public schools. They've got, Finland's got the best public schools in the world. Uh, its public schools are better than, you know, the most expensive private schools in, in, in most countries. Um, so, so a lot of Finnish people, you know, they're really content. They, they, they don't have that kind of negative view of where they're going just because they've got a large government or because their government delivers. They have to pay because the government delivers. Um, and you see maybe France has pushed it so far that it's got a lot of problems and, and uh, uh, 
you, you look further to the left and you see, okay, countries like emerging countries like India, Rwanda, Senegal, you know, they're in this position where they've got pretty, pretty weak governments. There's a lot that they can't do. Um, there's legacy corruption, there's authoritarianism, you know, there's, there's problems with accountability. But they're quite small in terms of their burden on the overall economy. And so what do you see in India? I mean, in India, I think 185 million people have been lifted out of poverty in the last 12 years. Uh, the largest economic growth in the world um, over the last well, over six of the last five, five of the last six years. Uh, Rwanda, you know, standardly just about the largest economic growth in South Africa, in Africa. Um, and there's a bit of a story there to consider. Um, which side of that line do you really want to be? Just in case you think that line is arbitrary, because I've said it's arbitrary. You know, maybe South Africa is above the line. And we look at Saab, the South African Reserve Bank published a working paper on the fiscal multiplier, uh, calculations by a you know, uh, team of economists, and uh, the definition of the fiscal expenditure multipliers, the government spending a rand on the margin, is it increasing GDP by more than a rand? Then it's above one. So that's what you're seeing in 2009 and 2010. When the government spends a rand, it's bumping the economy even more than that. Uh, now, it might have been the case that a private guy could have spent that rand and hunted by even more. Uh, but at least when the government's spending, it's getting banquets back. You know? it's, it's buying something and it's getting more value out of that than, than, than the nominal value of the purchase. That's where you want to be. Uh, then it comes down below one. And typically, once you get below one, you worry. Once you get below half, um, sort of all the economic literature that I surveyed, uh, a vast number of papers, like everyone agrees below 60, below 0.6, below 60%, uh, you're in crisis. Because that means you're spending a rand and the economy's going up by 60 cents. I mean, you could have just left that rand in private hands, not taxed it. Someone else would have spent that rand and it would have gone up by a rand or more. So you've wasted 40, 50 cents. You've cut that value out. The Saab found in 2015, 2016, 2017, you know, that South Africa's gone negative. When the government spends a rand, it actually reduces GDP. I can't find another country that really has staying negative fiscal expenditure multipliers. It's another world record. Uh, so, you know, how, how much is that important? How important is that? Could it be affecting unemployment? Yeah. Uh, good. Because the government is so large, it's taking up so much uh, that it impacts everybody. Uh, this is a picture of the growth in procurement. Uh, we've got these uh, data points from the, the SARC, thank you. Um, now, these are not inflation adjusted. And I can caution you about that because anything that's not inflation adjusted over a couple of decades is going to grow dramatically. But the reason I chose to put it this way is because it's the growth in government expenditure that's been unfunded that has caused us to borrow so much money as a, as a, as a country, that's pushed our risk premiums up, that's pushed interest rates up, that's pushed inflation up, which has made the case that you know what used to be 100 billion is now a, a trillion. So this actually is a driver of inflation, which is why it's not um, such a bad idea to sort of just put it as it is. Um, it, when it balloons, it, 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 really, it really matters from a fiscal and a monetary perspective. And so you see, we crossed the trillion rand a year threshold uh, in 2022 in government procurement. So this is buying toilet paper, transformers, transistors, uh, you know, traffic controllers, all the stuff that government buys. It's a lot of money to be spending every year, one trillion bucks plus. And you can see that there was a huge growth in the in the, in the Zoom era, shall we say, and then a bit of a plateau, and then it started to grow again dramatically. Um, now, that growth has not been taking place in uh, asset purchases, SOE asset purchases and government asset purchases. You see the blue, the dark blue, and the light blue. They remaining very small. What are those assets? That's infrastructure. That's not growth. In fact, that almost disappeared under an opposer. Uh, and it's not really coming back. Um, the thing that's growing is buying the things that break and updates. And we just heard from uh, Minister Gorongwana, you know, the government's spending twice as much on new computers as the market rates. 
interesting thing you have, you have in the treasury. That's the kind of growth in procurement that you see. So uh, if you combine these two, I'm just going to leave this here and say, if you combine these, 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 these points, right, you've got massively increasing corruption, massively decreasing effectiveness of regulatory control, massively increasing uh, size of government. The, the corrupt machine is taking more and more space in the economy. I think that the, the answer that you've got to come to is like, what do we need to do to just go back a few steps? We need to move in the trim direction. We need to somehow reduce the amount of resources being swallowed by government and somehow improve the government's ability to use the resources that it's still taking to deliver goods and services in a good way. So this is the silver bullet. Like, I think wherever you are on the political spectrum, in terms of, you know, do you think Ireland or South Korea has got a better model uh, once you've actually got into like a, a developed state? At this position that we're in, I think we should all agree that we need to move in a trim direction. We need to reduce the size and improve the quality of government. And we need, therefore, to look for something that can achieve that. What can achieve that? And the former Chief Justice, Raymond Zondo, I think he gives a hugely important part of the answer. And he, he's not doing this uh, from a budget side. He's doing this from a quality of corruption control, of, of regulatory control side. The, the Zondo report on state capture said, uh, roughly speaking, that uh, the conflict between racial preferencing and value for money, maximizing value for money, is creating this huge confusion. And as a result of the confusion, there's a lot of corruption. Because people can get away in a confused space with doing whatever they want. How can you account? How can you hold them to account? Everything's so confused. You can't tell. And therefore, we had state capture, and therefore we're going to continue to have state capture. So if we can remove that obstacle to clarity, to transparency, to competitiveness, if we can, as the Zondo Commission said, maximize the value for money to make that the top priority, then uh, we can improve manageability and reduce costs. That's what we were looking for. That was the, those were the desired rate. So here, um, you know, there's a very, very long report where we go into these calculations in detail. But here is the, 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 the sort of headline estimate of how much South Africa could save by implementing the Zondo advice to maximize value for money in the regulatory scheme, in, in procurement, rather. That 1.1 trillion, just, just get the best bang for buck, you know, as a first priority. And um, just to run you through some of the numbers, we, I estimate that 5.7 billion uh, is spent annually on recorded BE premiums. Now, I must say, I've talked about BE premiums on national TV and radio and stuff, and like often get like uh, pushed back. Like you can't say they're BE premiums. Um, I read a paper in 2007 by Professor Mithiro. Uh, which mentions the premiums of preferential procurement, which serves BEE, and, and those were estimated to be 20% in that particular study. It was a small study in the Northwest province, but it was 20% of the budget was being spent on BEE premiums. Uh, just uh, two weeks ago, um, a former Chief Procurement Officer in Treasury, uh, Willy Matibula, was talking about premiums being spent, that the government's prepared to spend on effectively on BEE. Uh, so BE premiums are there, it's just that they are not budgeted for and not discussed. And there's reasons why people both on the right and the left don't want to discuss them. But these BE premiums are being spent. No one really knows how much they are. I estimate uh, that they're only 0.5% of the total procurement budget, which is a tiny amount. Could be much more than that. But just politically, I couldn't understand how it could be any less than that. That comes to 5.7 billion rand on, on recorded BE premiums. Unreported BE premiums occur with the cheapest company, or the best value for money company, opted out of the process uh, or was pre disqualified from the process. So you can't even, Treasury can't even see um, what they had missed. Uh, I estimate that again, very low at 11.3 billion. Uh, and so, that, so saving the money there on the BE premium, 17 billion Rand a year. So it's significant. Um, 
but it's not really going to change the whole direction of the economy to say that. Instead, what's going to change the direction of the economy is the Zondo difference, and that's the reduction in cost to corruption that occurs every year by maximizing value for money, by realizing that transparency dividend that you get when you just simply maximize value for money as a first priority. Um, and based off of uh, former Chief Procurement Officer Kenneth Brown's estimate of 40% of procurement being wastage um, in, uh, back in 2015, we've discounted that, we've uh, updated it with inflation, we've used very conservative estimates there, and we have estimated that 132 billion rand could be saved uh, pretty shortly by, by shifting the system. And that brings you to a total zone dividend of about 150 billion. Uh, so that's getting the government that, you know, if you, if you implement that, it means the government can spend 150 billion rand less in that 1.1 trillion and still get the same amount of goods and services. Um, well, what do we want to do? You know, I'm just going to pause there and say, this is such, I'm so serious about how, how well this would work that I didn't actually want to suggest it because I, because it, it, it gave me nightmares. Because if you suddenly have such a windfall game where you can spend 150 billion rand less and still get the same amount of stuff, a lot of people are going to say, well, then you should just spend 150 billion less and get the same amount of stuff. And then we can reduce new borrowing. And I think that would be a night. Uh, because what that would do, it would be austerity in the derived sense of the term. It would reduce aggregate consumer demand. It would mean suddenly there's 150 billion rand less around, sloshing around. And that would uh, uh, certainly have a negative impact on economic growth in the short term. It'd be great in the long term, but in the short term, it would have a negative impact. If you look at Argentina in 2018, it went into default as it started implementing expenditure cuts. After it started expenditure cuts. Um, just cutting expenditure, even if it's by improved efficiency, doing that alone, it can be like the trend direction that I show over here, where you reduce expenditure, but you're also reducing government capacity. It would more directly be a case where you're reducing expenditure, but you're also reducing GDP. So I thought, what can we do with this 150 billion to avoid that problem? Well, the best thing you can do is put it back in the pockets of ordinary people. A VAT tax cut from 15% to 11.5% is the best way to put that money back in the hands of the poor. Uh, the, the, the distribution here, I've estimated, uh, using uh, st uh, sort of some international studies suggesting in our kind of situation we could expect business if we, if we start with just 100 billion rand through this VAT tax cut, uh, uh, being put back in the pockets of ordinary people, 50 billion of that would be hoovered up by business. You cut the VAT, businesses don't cut their prices, some of them don't cut their prices, so they get that extra. Uh, that's important because that 30 billion would be split, including black businesses, and they're going to be losing the BEE premiums, but they're likely to be getting back as much through the reduction in VAT. So it's very important that black businesses shouldn't be afraid of uh, moving beyond PE. In fact, black businesses should embrace it because they're going to do better. They're going to have the same in the short run and more in the long run through economic growth. Then if you look at the top uh, richest, uh, ninth and 10th decile, uh, they are going to be getting you know, 12 billion, 27 billion together by 40 billion. Uh, so that is the, uh, 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 um, that's a big chunk of it. Um, it should be noted that uh, you know, the majority of those people are not white. Uh, if you look at stats to say data, if you're helping the top 20%, you're not helping white people. Uh, you're helping uh, people that are, that are, in general, sort of the, the most productive. Um, but really, uh, it's important to try and help those, those who are the most needy. And uh, of all of the various options that we've reviewed, and we can get this into Q&A, the, the bad tax cut seems the best poised to, to help the most needy uh, and uh, putting billions in, back into their pocket. And you know that occurs every year. And uh, overall, the, the, the target is that in doing so, you stimulate some economic growth. So you improve through the Zondo dividend, you improve 
government effectiveness, you decrease corruption, you improve government regulatory. There's a short-term problem, which is that suddenly you're so efficient, there's less money. Well, you deal with that by cutting taxes as well, putting 100, 100 to 150 billion back into the economy uh, and doing so in a way that is going to channel the most of it directly to the poor to avoid this sort of trickle-down uh, kind of uh, policy framework. Okay, that's a conclusion. Thanks. Thank you very much, Gabriel. I must say that was um, intense. Uh, but that, I, I think the, the, the credit of the research is in its depth. Um, I have a few questions here that, were, that, that have come through throughout the course of your presentation. Um, I'm going to throw the first one to both of you, Gabriel, and then I'm going to come to you and then to you after that, John. Um, if these measures are implemented, what will happen to the economy? What will happen to unemployment, poverty, and inequality? Shall I jump in with that, John? Yes. And please fill in, fill in what I miss. So, the, the precisely, I, I think that this kind of question is best answered in different timescales. In the short term, here's what's going to happen. Uh, you're going to have a lot of political noise, um, and that's not directly affecting the economy unless it spooks markets. Now, you have to ask yourself, do you think that local investors and foreign investors are going to pull their money out of South Africa when they hear that the government is changing into a position where it wants to maximize value for money? I think the question sort of answers itself. I think you're going to have to look very far to find a business person who hears, oh, we're going to start maximizing value for money. And the business person says, oh, okay, well, then I don't want to do that. Do that. So in the short term, there'll be political noise, but there's not going to be capital flights. If you both implement the zone of dividends and do the VAT tax cut, the VAT tax cut will, will mean 100 billion rand uh, sloshing around the economy, particularly uh, you know, distributed fairly evenly across the economy. That means businesses have more incentive to go look out, where can I sell you something that you're now going to be able to afford that you couldn't afford before? What does that mean? Well, if I'm, if I'm doing that, I can hire someone. So let me hire someone to help you. Okay, what's that do? That means there's another job. What does that mean? That job now has a bit more bucks. So he can buy something that he couldn't afford before. Ah, that's called a, virtual, a virtuous growth cycle. So the midterm effect is an expected virtuous growth cycle. And uh, that should be buoyed by uh, confidence in the government uh, that is you know, coming from people seeing the fruitful rewards of cleaner administration. John? Well, maybe what we would add to that is the effect it would have, I think, especially on poorer South Africans, and an analogy we've often asked now, uh, used in our discussions, Gabriel, is that we imagine that there's a, a dirt road between the main road and the village, which uh, the government is proposing to tar and to, to make, make a proper road. And it has enough money to do this. Let's say the distance is 10 kilometers, there's enough money to tar 10 kilometers, and you can connect the village to the main road with a tarred road. But if you pay the BE premium, the money is going to run out after seven kilometers and the people in the village will be left without the connection to the main road that can help them uh, have better access to markets, better access to uh, work opportunities, et cetera, et cetera. So what we're currently seeing is with the, with the current system is that people, especially who are dependent on state services, are the ones paying the price for bad procurement rules and for BE premiums. And these are the people that would be most helped by having the state uh, get value for money, bang for buck, as we put it, um, and that would have an economic impact as well. So I think it would have very positive effects on um, job creation, on economic growth, uh, and on reducing poverty as well. Herman. Then uh, an another question that came through, uh, and John, let me come to you uh, first with this. Uh, given that we've just listened to Minister Gordon Guana uh, giving 
his budget speech and, and within a very political context. Um, how does what the IRA is presenting now relate to the state of our politics? Is this at all implementable? John? Yeah, re really tough question, Herman, um, because, of course, uh, the I think the incentives are aligned in a way that makes it quite difficult for these kind of procurement rule changes to happen. Um, so we know that many of the main supporters of the ruling party uh, benefit from the BE premiums. And for the ruling party to remove these opportunities and these premiums from those beneficiaries um, is going to be a political problem. Um, and Gabriel was saying earlier, that if you were to introduce these changes, you would get a lot of political noise. And I think that's true. However, I think at the same time, we're also seeing at the moment quite a lot of flux in our politics. Um, we are seeing the ANC under pressure. Uh, and I think it means that the ANC, as well as all the other political parties, are having to think a little bit harder about how to make a, a good case for growth and for better um, and more effective state services. And this gives them an answer to that question. Uh, you formulated it as, as arming the pro-growth forces, Herman. I think that's an appropriate formulation. This is part of that. You know, this is a, another tool in the arsenal of, of arming the pro-growth forces. And uh, let's hope that the political classes listen. Yeah, I think Gabriel? from my side, uh, I think it's really worth focusing on black business. Um, the, in the long version of the paper, it's sort of like I, I spend, it's like a whole paper unto itself. Um, as a historical analogy, um, I, I, for a time, I was sort of a mentee of the George Palmer Trust, and I'll just recount an anecdote. George Palmer was the chief editor of the Financial Mail. Uh, in the sort of peak days of apartheid. And the editorial line that he, and with some help from John Kane Berman, the late great uh, leader of the Institute of Race Relations, that they ran, was that white business needs to figure out that apartheid is bad for white business. Um, unfortunately, uh, even in what I would consider liberal circles, I often see this idea that apartheid was like, you know, bad for black people, good for white people. Um, relatively speaking, in a, in a, in a zero-sum game, power asymmetry, yes, of course, obviously. Uh, but in terms of real, fruitful, material values, uh, absolutely not. Apartheid was terrible for white business. It was terrible for all business uh, because, it was, because it discriminated on the basis of arbitrary characteristics. It repressed consumer demand. It repressed the skills base. It repressed the ability of people to get together to do voluntary exchange. It was a stupid idea, as well as being a wicked one. And uh, and it was essential uh, in John K. Berman's analysis, for example, and in George Palmer's, for white businesses to figure that out so that they would stop sponsoring their own uh, incarceration economically. It is essential today for black businesses to realize how much better they will do uh, once the BEE premium is removed, how much better... All businesses will do, but specifically black businesses will do. And I think that no political parties are trying to make that case. And I think as long as that case is not being made, uh, this is this is not going to go so. However, if I look in the multi-party coalition, if I look in the sort of new absurdities, like you know, I, I, I don't think just to pick out one party, rise and signs, I just don't see that new political party touching this. Uh, although it sort of pitches itself, you know, its posters first came up in uh, areas that I know with a, with a lot of, you know, black multi-millionaires and centi-millionaires and so on. Um, I think that new parties uh, could could jump on this, try and identify this as one of their things. I think old parties could too. Uh, but I think I think that's really the key political obstacle to to this common sense reform is ameliorating the concern. Look, you think you're going to be in trouble? There's going to be worse. No. This is going to be so much better. You think you've been making money in a zero growth economy? You're going to make so much more money once this economy starts growing. Get excited about letting go be if you're a black business. That's got to be the message because it's the reality. Now, um, speaking of uh, political parties, perhaps not new ones, but uh, opposition parties that are in control of some municipalities, um, Gabriel, do opposition-controlled municipalities have uh, the scope or, or the opportunity to implement some of 
these recommendations currently? Yes, absolutely. Uh, the current procurement system occurs under the PPPFA, like some things in government, the name really rolls off the tongue. Um, and that has a clause which says uh, it is in, you can get an exemption from paying the AE premiums if it's in the national interest or it's in the public interest. Guess what the Zonda Report's language is? It is in the national interest, the primary national interest, ultimately, to get maximum value for money. So, I mean, I don't know, this is not a conspiracy theory or anything, but like when a very legal-minded person uses language directly mirroring the language in the triple PFA, you know, I think that's like a pretty strong invitation to go ahead and make the application uh, to Treasury to get these exemptions. So the city of Cape Town last year published a value for money report and it found that um, it was spending, you know, for example, 80,000 Rand on traffic controllers instead of 75,000 Rand. 80% of the time it was sort of getting value for money, but 10, 20% of the time it was not getting value for money. I think what the city of Cape Town needs to be doing, I think it's a no brainer, is filing for exemptions from the EE uh, where it's not getting value for money. And I think, uh, you know, whichever city does this, whichever organ of state does this, they're going to be blazing a trail for the rest, showing South Africans how to do it right. However, Berman, I have to tell you the bad news. The public procurement bill uh, uh, is, is moving along at a faster pace than uh, just about any major reform of its kind has ever moved before the ANC is determined to get it passed before the election in May 20, you know, just in a couple of months where Parliament will be dissolved and they'd have to start over again. Here's the public procurement bill that at the moment the, the cap on BE premiums is 11% if it's above 50 million rand. It's 25% if it's below 50 million rand. So that's already crazy. If you spend 40 million rand on a contract, you can then spend an extra 10 million on someone's racial profile to make some rich person even richer and as John says, have the road be shorter so that the community can't get there. What the public procurement bill does is it pushes the premium up to 66%. So that's mind blowing. It also removes the calculability of the premium in many cases by saying you can have set aside and pre-qualification criteria. So you can make it so that this contract only goes to military veterans that are black women, and this contract only goes to youth that are black. And this contract, and then you can have a nice little, you know, there can be only one person who can compete so they can bribe the official to make sure that they have that big qualification thing set up in the first place so that they guarantee the contract. It's like, uh, it's a it's a flipping, it's such a strange idea. By the way, the data that came out last night shows, roughly speaking, 5% of public procurement went to white owned businesses uh, in the last 1.2 trillion rands worth of procurement that's been surveilled by Treasury. So the idea that we need this new bill now because white businesses are dominating is Meshugana. It is so crazy that the only way you can pass this idea is by not mentioning the numbers. And no one wants to talk about the size of the PEE premium. It is unconstitutional for the Treasury not to... Did you hear the PEE premium mentioned in the budget? You hear the amount going to white business versus black business? No. Um, that's how that's how this thing is being driven through in a fog of ignorance. And and uh, anyway, so the point is, once the public procurement bill goes through, to answer your question directly, at that stage, I don't think organs of state or municipality will be able to get exemptions uh, through the law. They'll have to go through the court through saying that the law is unconstitutional. That's one of the reasons that I oppose the public procurement bill because I want organs of state to have this option to implement the Zondo dividends at a local level. Mm. Uh, John, over to you and perhaps let me add something uh, to the question. Um, Gabriel mentions organs of state. This, I assume, includes things like everything from hospitals through to SOEs? Yeah, it includes pretty much everything. Um, and I think that's also a reflection of why we have problems in, in all different areas. Uh, when people talk about ESCOM, for example, and ending load shedding, much is often made of who the CEO is. And I think ultimately that actually doesn't matter so much. It really is, is more about the rules of the game than about the players playing it. Uh, and one of the rules that is really distorting this game um, is the public procurement rules. So ESCOM cannot, uh, well, it can, if it has an exemption, buy on a value for money basis. But without the exemption, it, it, it has to pay premiums effectively. Um, and also these procurement rules 
I think, provide cover for corruption. So you might have mm -hmm. legitimate BE premiums, legitimate according to the law. But of course, often it is an excuse to you know, vastly overcharge on all sorts of things. Uh, and, and ordinary South Africans are the ones paying the price for that. And it's the entire economy that's paying the price for that. Our economic growth is capped because ESCOM can't produce enough electricity. And it can't produce enough electricity because it's forced to pay premiums all over the place. That's one of the reasons. So yeah, it, it affects uh, almost everything across the board. And uh, maybe before we move on, can I just ask a question of Gabriel, which is, um, have you had any engagements with Treasury on the BE premium? So do they maybe uh, privately track this? Uh, when, when you ask them, what sort of response do you get from them? Yeah, we've asked and they've, and they've not answered. And it's surprising because we have had a long-standing correspondence with Treasury, which has been fruitful and collaborative and respectful and, and, and helpful. Um, to give you a sense of how important these premiums are to Treasury, in 2022, correct me if I'm getting this wrong, it was 21, uh, Sarkalipa, then called Afribusiness, won the first uh, BE case against BE, where the 2017 Treasury regulations, when Praveen Goran was the minister, uh, had said, you can you can just tell white businesses not to apply in the first place. And then, then you won't have recorded BE premiums. You won't know how much extra you pay. Um, and Sarkalipa didn't argue on that basis. They argued on another basis. And they won. They got that struck down on the basis that the minister can't say it. Maybe... Parliament can say that. And so now Parliament is saying that through the public procurement law. Um, anyway, when this happened, Treasury was confused. They were like, hold on, you've struck down the 2017 regulations. Does this mean we're allowed to still charge BE premiums but in a different way? Or does it mean we can't do it at all until we have new regulations? We're confused. And the Director General at the time said, cancel every new tender in the country. No more advertising new tenders until we know how much BE premiums we are allowed to spend. So, I mean, to Treasury, it was more important to know exactly how much BE premiums they could spend than it was to keep the country going. Um, and I think that gives an indication of how important it is. How much it is? No one knows. We've asked, they won't tell us. Um, we are, you know, we, we, our, uh, our attorneys have drafted papers to, 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 to rip this information legally out of Treasury because it is under Section 216 of the Constitution. Number one, the first duty of Treasury is to implement cost control and transparency. Now, again, I say it has never been the only time that I have ever found a Treasury document reporting to say how much the premiums are is this 2010 study by uh, Professor McKittle, who passed away two years ago from UKZN. And it wasn't even the headline of the study. He was asking procurement officers in Mabato, Northwest, how is this new BE system working for you guys? And he found like 80% of them said, we don't have the skills or qualifications to implement it, which is an amazing bit of honesty that, that you know somehow passed by the wayside. And he asked them, do you think it's an extra financial burden on the fiscus to have to do BE? And half said yes and half said no, which is very strange, right? Like this is a matter of numbers. Is it an extra burden? One question is, do you think it's a good idea? You can imagine them half say yes, half say no. Mm -hmm. It's a different question. Is this costing more? That's an accounting question. And he's asking the accountants. And half of the accountants say it is costing more. And half the accountants say it's not costing more. That's the confusion, just to reference earlier, that facilitates the corruption. When you're that confused, when your accountants can't agree on that, they, anyone can steal anything. But, but the point is to try and see if it actually was costing more. The professor asked Treasury. And he got a small little re report back on a small fraction, and 20% of the contracts were being spent on premiums. Outside of that, John, 2010, I cannot find a single shred of evidence from Treasury to specify what the BE premiums are. Sure. Now that is worrying in and of itself. John? No, I just wanted to say crazy. <laughs> I find that very yes. crazy. So, our, our accountability, sorry, just to say, accountability hits a brick wall from the very first moment from the budget. Yeah. No, that is that is astonishing. Um, our hour is up, and I thank everyone for having joined today. John, perhaps I should give you the final word. 
before I wrap this session up. What should South Africans take away? What's the key takeaway from today's briefing and this, frankly, stellar piece of research? Mm. Well, I think my, my, my first comment would be to, to echo what you just said, which is that Gabriel has really produced a remarkable piece of research here. Um, I've had the opportunity to read it probably five times now in the various editing rounds. So I'm, I'm uh, finally getting to grips with it. <laughs> I do encourage members of the public to download the report um, and, you know, just page through it, go through it, because there's a lot in there. Um, and what it reveals really is shocking, um, especially on this, on this uh, X-shaped graph with the state becoming larger and larger and its effectiveness going down faster and faster. Um, the, the very obvious conclusion is that you really need to cut down the state and make it more efficient at the same time. Um, that is a big ask because a state is a huge beast. Um, but this is a very practical proposal that says, you know, there's one thing you can make, you can do one small change you can make to make the state more effective. And that is just make it spend its money in a cost effective way on a value for money basis as the constitution requires. Very simple. The second thing you can do is to reduce the size of the state, which is just growing bigger and bigger. And you can do that very simply by cutting that and just saying, okay, let's just leave a bit more money in the pockets of consumers, uh, in businesses. Uh, let's stimulate the economy by doing that and then reap the, reap the rewards of that. And so um, the, the takeaway for me is uh, for the listeners, for the viewers, uh, focus on economic growth, um, demand that from the politicians, from the businesses, from the CSOs, the uh, civil society organizations, demand that ways must be found to spark economic growth. You'll get many of the arguments from us at the IRR, like the ones that Gabriel presented today, from other organizations, organizations as well. Take those on board, internalize them, and demand it from the political classes that we, we must get economic growth. It really is absolutely essential. Here, here. And as I ended uh, our session earlier this week when we launched the first uh, Blueprint for Growth paper, let me end in a similar vein. Economic growth isn't about some spreadsheet somewhere looking better or an abstract line of data going up. It is really about removing the barriers that exclude people from using their time and their talents to become income earning value add problem solvers within their communities. So whenever we talk about economic growth and whenever you take our arguments for economic growth further, remember that this is about ultimately the human dignity of having the opportunity to live well and to live free. The idea presented in economic growth isn't one that is abstract. It is one that is experienced every day by too many people suffering in poverty and by too many opportunities not being open. And Gabriel, I want to thank you for your time, for your incredible work on this. I know it was a long time coming. This wasn't just a research report in the typical vein of research report that takes a month to perhaps, if you're stretching it, to compile. This was many, many, many months of research and it really shows. John, for your time also, I want to thank you this morning. And then finally, to you at home, at business, uh, wherever you are following us, please, this is important and this is about you. We'll see you again and we want to continue to arm South Africa's pro-growth forces. All the best.